given me ancient maps for the new world I had entered as a child. Not through jacking into cyberspace on William Gibson's laptop Ono Sendai, but through Bach, Beethoven, and Stravinsky. What the Buddhist discovers in meditation is that there is no absolute discrete self, but there are infinite relations in all directions that are instrumental in bringing forth beings that pass together. Compassion equals passing together in concerts of time and space. The enlightened being travels more lightly than the heavy ego burden with the matter of his or her afflictions. And the enlightened being can easily offer its music in concert with others to experience mystical states of union with Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, angels and gods, or a vast and universal form of Godhead beyond the personifications of deities. The being that cannot open itself to these multiple dimensions chooses not to create its destiny, but to have its fate inflicted upon it in the samsaric form of suffering and evil. Notice how in our technological culture we can enthusiastically embrace Gibson's cyberpunk visions of voodoo and evil far more readily than we can Steiner's theosophical visions of angels and grace. In literature, dystopias are always far more compelling than vapid clerical visions of heavenly virtue. Gibson's work is enthralling because he understands as a writer that evil is the enunciation of a newly emerging level of societal organization. But if one truly wishes to understand the landscape of electronic noise in which the individual etheric body is so assaulted that an individual soul can no longer incarnate in a human body, then one has to read Steiner. The Mondo 2000 magazine enthusiast and apologist for the new technology of neuroreceptor drugs and full body suit immersions into virtual reality <coughs> will never discuss the side effects. So what needs Rudolf Steiner to balance the hype of the California snake oil salesman of drugs and computers? In the 60s, LSD externalized the collective unconscious, the astral plane, albeit in a kitsch and degraded form. This appropriation of the astral plane into the public space is now being followed up by the appropriation of the etheric plane. As cyberdelic drugs combine with the effects of the invisible environment of drugs and foods and the polluted biosphere, the cumulative effect will be to erode organic autonomy and lower fertility rates. This has already begun to happen. <clears throat> and this will stimulate meta-business to compete with agribusiness. Just as America appropriated the family farm into feedlots and factories, so will it appropriate the family into the laboratory. Thus, the appropriation of the astral body in the 60s through LSD and the appropriation of the etheric body in the 90s will pave the way for the final act of the appropriation of the physical body around the turn of the century. Thus, America, the land of rugged individualism, will become the land of ragged individuals, first economically, with the homeless in New York where I live, and then physiologically. Through genetic engineering, in vitro semination, and reproductive technologies yet to come, the individual will be so contained that incarnation will be captured in engines of procreation. Technologies will become ensouled, just as souls become denatured and shifted into collective lattices rather than into the animal hominid bodies of old evolutionary times. Quote, demons will be able to take human form and souls will be able to dwell in cognitive lattices so that it is small wonder that today's science fiction landscape of novels and computer games is filled with mythologies of dungeons and dragons, monsters and devils. This paranoia is crazy, but the caricatured sketch reveals an isomorphism to an evolutionary metanoia that is beyond anything we could call normal. One can clue into this phenomenon of cultural evolution through the paranoid caricatures of the fundamentalists, who curiously seem to object to the Luciferic New Ages more than the Aramonic technologists in computer science. Or one can clue into it through cyberpunk fiction. Or one can get more than a clue if one reads Steiner and realizes that what one is looking at in the new electronic America so celebrated and hyped by Stuart Brand and Howard Rheingold is a collectivization that can be mythologically identified as the incarnation of the demon Araman. When life evolved, molecules were enclosed within the membrane of the cell. When mind evolved, cells were enclosed within the membrane of an individual organism. Now a planetary entity is evolving, and individual minds are being enclosed within a planetary lattice. 
New Age folks see it as a bodhisattvic ideal of empathy for all sentient beings, from whales and dolphins in the sea to starving nomads in the Sahel. Skinheads feel it as the power of the collective as they stomp in a rock concert or murder and rampage around soccer matches. <coughs> Scientific folk feel it as they race to replace minds with planetary lattices of fifth generation computers or package nature in Biosphere 2 in preparation for its export to Mars. And I'll stop there and we can question and argue. <coughs> Yes, sir. I don't know the difference between the astral body and the etheric body. Can you explain that? Yeah, the technical terms in Sanskrit are the Manamaya Kosa was the food body, uh, which would be basically, you know, what we would conventionally call the body and then stop, but they keep going. And then there's the Pranamaya Kosa, which is the etheric body or the subtle body, and this is the uh, what would be called chi in, in uh, acupuncture or building up chi in kung fu or the martial arts where a certain kind of... Uh, almost electrical energy that as, you know, athletes uh, feel or, or dancers. Michael Murphy here in San Rafael is publishing, I think next spring, a 800 page book on the cities and the, the uh, future of the body in which he does the cultural history and the research into uh, dancers and ballerinas and athletes and saints and ecstatics with the stigmata and researches this whole area of the subtle body. And then um, I think that the Sanskrit of, for the astral body, which would be psyche or anima or the collective unconscious is, uh, is it Vijnanamaya Kosa? I've almost forgotten. And then uh, the higher mental and then the causal body. So there are conventionally five. Oftentimes the way these are, are rendered in pop culture, if you saw the movie uh, Baron Munchausen, each of the figures that surround the Baron have some of the characteristics of one of the subtle bodies. Or in Japanese puppetry, if you've ever seen a Bunraku play, you'll see a, a puppet, but then there'll be hooded figures manipulating the puppet. This is the esoteric dimension of the subtle bodies that activate the visible ego, but it, it doesn't end there in these, in these esoteric traditions. So physical, etheric, astral, mental, causal. Those are the theosophical translations of the Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, I wonder <laughs> by its, its almost total omission, you feel that the etheric body of the Earth is so totally overwhelmed by the products of human beings. Well, there, is, uh, there are some people who say that there's a certain uh, frequency that the, the nervous system operates on, uh, Hertz, and, and that in, in conditions of silence you can actually hear the sort of pulse. Uh, if you go into meditation temples, oftentimes you can hear a kind of high, high frequency sound that's very characteristic of places where there's a lot of practice going on. And so if you go into places of deep uh, solitude, for example, we built this meditation chapel at 8,500 feet up in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. So that kind of thing is what's missing. You know, Ivan Illich said that uh, silence is commons and they, now we're losing the commons. And so um, the quality in which those experiences are no longer uh, available is part of, I think, this kind of collective phenomenon where noise is considered part of the collectivization that brings us together and makes the individual no longer the, uh, the focus of incarnation. So it's much more shifting things into collective uh, patterns or collective. And of course, if you're a Buddhist and you look at what is the self anyway, I mean, you can't be an individual without a language or without parents. And so what brings us forth as, quote, an individual is a collectivity. But now society is changing the nature of what, what would be considered the collectivity. But the kind of silence, uh, I think for this other generation, silence isn't considered positive, it's considered an oral darkness. And so you have Muzak in elevators and Muzak in, in shopping malls, and you're never allowed to have silence, because that's really kind of ontological angst, because you have to confront this hollowness at the core, or you'll make noise and you'll start snapping your fingers or whistling in the dark or do something to avoid this other experience. Whereas in contemplative practice, you're forced to you know, listen and hear this other, as Keats would call it, unheard music. Yes, sir. Could you expand your point on paranoia and metanoia? I heard you to say, I want to see if this is so, that a lot of this flowering of technology is a paranoid attempt to assimilate a metanoia. No, I was saying that the fundamentalists who attack the technologies or the New Agers oftentimes generate uh, paranoid narratives. Uh, and that paranoia and metanoia are isomorphic but not identical.